Hey everybody, I'm Franziska and I am extremely excited that you're all here today because we have a very, very cool topic and I think some of you might already know, if you're not new here, that I started out as a paleontologist myself. Proof is this little buddy because, you know, he had to be here because paleontology represent. <laughs> and I started Café Klatsch mit Wissenschaft, oh, it feels like a long time ago now, we started in August. 2019 and my very first speaker was also a paleontologist so we've come full circle, full circle. Uh, I know I know like uh, I'm trying to have some gaps between all my paleontologists I want to invite <laughs> so they don't think I'm biased which I am just a tiny bit but yeah I've um, been doing this for quite a quite a while now and I think we started doing it uh, in an online format in April, I want to say April or May last year. Mm -hmm. So it's been a wild ride. And I think it's really fun to always see when people have their coffee, even if it's online. Um, but yeah, we get to reach more and more people outside of Berlin, which I'm super excited about. And I'm very excited to have Antoine here. I think you're my first, um, my first French person, you're not, you're, but oh. not my first paleontologist. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's I'm excited left, to have you. Left. <laughs> there are there are a few, and there are quite a few really great paleontologists I know that do yeah that are from France. So I'm excited that you're here, and I'm excited for everybody to get to know you a little bit because we met. Oh God, we also met in 2019, I believe, for the Berlin Science Week. You gave a talk at Pint sure. of Science, and you came highly recommended, and I know now why. <laughs> you even brought like pictures and everything to the pub. It was great. And um, that's when I knew, okay, I have to have this guy <laughs> at, at Cafe Clutch. Uh, so I already know that you're doing a great, a great job. Um, well, thanks for the invitation. <laughs> I'm really honored to be here. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, I always have my first questions uh, for you. So I hope everybody that does have questions, you can write them in the chat. I'm going to have an eye on it. And whenever it's convenient, I might remind Antoine or read a question for everybody. You can, of course, also write them on YouTube. We'll check and put them in the chat here. Um, are you okay with me, like, every now and then interrupting you if there's a question? Absolutely. That's okay. Very yeah. good, very good. So I have some um, prepared that I always ask all my scientists because I think um, it's interesting to know a little bit about where you're coming from and what your background is. And I would like to ask you how you ended up in science. Are you the first scientist in your family or did you get inspired by like an, an uncle or an aunt or parents? So, well, first of all, I'm gonna say hello to everybody because I think I haven't done it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, to answer your question, it's actually, I think a bit of both my parents. Um, my mother is a pharmacist and she has a PhD in pharmacology. Uh, she studied mostly botanics and uh, yeah, so she is the scientist in my parents. My dad is absolutely not a scientist, is, is about as, you know, the rigor you need in science to, the, to, to just like uh, do experiments and have uh, uh, steady and rigorous results. He, he is not like that really, but he's, he's more of a, an adventurer of some sort. Um, he's a guy who did a whole lot of things in his, in his life and he traveled a lot. And um, one thing, so, I mean, I was interested in dinosaurs from a, and, and like fossils from a very uh, young age, but my dad traveled to, to Peru uh, and to Bolivia quite a lot when I was young because he was doing um, movies there. He, he's a, uh, he's what he's uh, he's been many things but like at the time he was making documentaries cool <laughs> yes and he went on a, an excavation site with uh, some scientists that he met there and he brought me um like uh, a fragment of bone from um how do you call that uh, those um those very thick carbon deposits um from like the glacial mm. age or something and uh yeah that that was uh, my first fossil i think it was a thing from peru that was found in some some uh, uh 
yeah, some in a swamp in in Peru. And that was quite that was quite fun. And yeah, then I, I became really interested and intrigued by all those animals. So that's why I wanted to become a paleontologist because they're just like insane creatures <laughs> like I never even before. Yeah, and, I I know what you mean. My parents are they're also not scientists. My mom is a chef, and my dad. Um, used to like repair cars and stuff like in a um like in a car garage i guess <laughs> and when i became a scientist they were like what's happening what is this <laughs> but they did know that i um i was really interested in paleontology from a young age i shocked someone the other day by saying i watched jurassic park like when it came out in cinemas and i was five and they're like okay I'm an adult and I got scared I'm like no I thought that was the coolest thing I've ever seen and I knew I had to this is this is for me I have to do that and then the main actress uh, had my had my last name right Ellie Sadler and my name is Sadler and I was like this right. is it oh, yeah this man. is this could be me oh, <laughs> and it was decided and no one in my family ever thought of me doing something else really and well here we are <laughs> But they yeah, never went there, to Bobby Fossils. There, there must be a couple of books about the impact of Jurassic Park on the paleo community because it's it's been huge. But I must say that I did not get into paleo because of Jurassic Park. I got into paleo because of Walking with Dinosaurs. Oh, yes. The series. Yeah, yeah. And Jurassic Park, I think I first saw as I was already in Bachelor. So I already had decided that I wanted to be a paleontologist. And then I saw Jurassic Park. Because I, oh. I, 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 I was afraid that it would be a scary movie. Yeah. Not really, but I don't know. Like as a kid, I, I didn't watch it. That's cool. I think um, I also watched A Land Before Time and I found that a lot scarier because I, it was actually sad, you know? I, I was just <laughs> so sad about it because, you know, spoiler alert, dinosaurs die in it. And I was like... Oh. <laughs> so I think uh, Jurassic Park kind of excited me and all the other stuff just made me sad so I stuck with the more violent <laughs> violent movies but I, think um, I remember also watching a uh, a silly it was a silly tv film like that Dinotopia or something it was called oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> that was one of my first movie ex like fiction experiences with uh with paleo and yeah, it's, it didn't have the same, yeah. the same uh, cachet as, uh, as Jurassic Park, I would say. That's true. It's, yeah. it's, ex it's exciting. Lots of paleontologists I know, they, <laughs> they've seen Jurassic Park and they love it. Um, but yeah, so, so you, did, you said you first started doing your bachelor's. What did you study? Did you start out as a geologist or how, what did you do for your bachelor's and where? Uh, so uh, as you know, but the viewers might not know, but to become a paleontologist, there's essentially two ways. Either you study biology and then you go more into the, the paleo side or you study geology and you start learning stuff about uh, things that are not rocks and that used to be alive. And that's what I did. I studied geology because uh, in my hometown, um, I mean, the nearest big c university city closest to my, to my uh, hometown, there was a geology course with a paleo course in it. So I did that. I did my bachelor in geology in Tours. That's in the middle of France, sort of. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had a discussion about that not so long ago. It's not really in the middle of France, but it's in the middle of France, like... Uh, Kassel is in the middle of Germany. Right. It's not really the middle, but yeah, I think they, we like to believe that we're in the middle. Um, yeah, so I did my bachelor there and then I did a master's that was in paleontology, like vertebrate paleontology. Right. So really focused. I think in France, there were there is also a couple of masters in invertebrates paleontology. I don't think there's anything in paleobotany, no. But um, yeah, so I did that. The first year was in Poitiers, uh, which is not too far from Tours, also pretty much in the center. Um, and you then stayed the, in France for your. It was in France. My okay. entire uh, study, yeah, my university years were in France. Uh, but from the second year of master, we had to do a research project. And I wasn't really interested in any of the projects they had to offer in France. And I had seen that guy in Berlin 
was working on really ancient stuff like Permian animals. So way before dinosaurs, that's what I wanted to study. And so I wrote him an email and he was kind enough to offer me a, a research project that I did. And uh, that's how I got to the museum actually. So I loved it so much wow. that I came back to France. Uh, I finished my master's uh, and then I just wanted to come back. Very cool. I'm glad we, we left a good, a good impression on you. <laughs> Yeah. I also spent most of my, my I mean, I spent, I spent my bachelor's and my master's. I also did geology first, and then I um, switched to evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. And in Berlin, we don't really have vertebrate paleontology. It's all like invertebrate stuff. So um, doing my undergrad, I went to Montana to an exchange because mm -hmm. I did field work in Montana. And I was like, I need to live here. It's beautiful. We have all the nature and all the fossils <laughs> and then my university which is Freie Universität they had um, a very cool exchange and I did that one which was fun and I did a lot of vertebrate stuff there which kind of reignited my love for it because doing my bachelor's I was like oh, there's so much physics and chemistry and only rocks I need fossils <laughs> <laughs> and yeah um so i i had to I had to leave <laughs> for for a little while and come back to to berlin but i've been at the museum since before i since before i did my bachelor's i don't know if you knew that about me i um lived abroad in london for a while and then i missed the deadline to apply for studies and i was like i want to do something though and i just handed in um like some application for becoming an intern because back then it was much more easy to be an intern and then I got a call and they're like hey you want to come and check out the museum and I was really excited and they showed me all the fossil rooms and I thought this was still an interview and I thought they show me all this cool stuff what if I don't get it that I know what <laughs> what this is <laughs> and uh, my supervisor who was my supervisor for years and years after that said okay so can you start Monday And I was just shocked. I was like, oh, so I have it. She's like, yeah, oh. wasn't, wasn't I clear? I'm like, no. <laughs> and that was 2009. So I've been at the museum on and off for a long time doing research and being a little student, <laughs> scrummaging around and trying to help with categorizing fossils and stuff. Was that in the, uh, the Natural History Museum in yeah. London? Oh, okay. No, 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 the one in Berlin. When I came back, oh. I was in, in okay. Berlin, yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been at the, the museum here in Berlin a long time. <laughs> oh, cool. I didn't know they, they were taking interns. Like I mean, not anymore. Ah. <laughs> Now there are, there are too many people, I think. And I was the only girl who applied, which helped, I think, because they always had all the boys who applied. And then there was me. <laughs> and it what, did, helped. what did you work on as an intern, if I may ask? Um, I worked on fossils from uh, Morocco. They're like all these little like crocodiles and I had to categorize them and categorize, 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 put them in a catalog, a, di a digital oh, catalog okay. and stuff too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then I got to do a little bit about, um, a little bit of everything, everything my supervisor did, I get to do a little bit, which was really fun. Um, so I didn't just have to make copies, <laughs> which was great. And yeah, then I... I just stuck around somehow, did my bachelor thesis there, my master thesis, and now I'm here and doing this, and I get to find out what you do and what other pe people do. It's really rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> what you already said, you, you already talked a little bit about my next question I had about, um, did you think you would end up in Berlin and did you move for your current position? So, so yeah, yes? I, I, I didn't think I would end up in Berlin before I decided to end up in Berlin. Mm. Um, It's, it's been a, a bumpy ride to come here, actually, because uh, so the master's was fine. Um, but then finding funding to do research is always mm. a, a tricky job, right? And uh, the, first, um, the first attempt that we did with uh, my supervisor, Jörg uh, Fröbig, was to write proposals as I was in France, working like a sort of bread and butter job that wasn't very interesting but um, doing that on the side and it didn't really work. And so at some, at some point he offered to hire me as a research assistant and that I would write a proposal to get funding uh, from Berlin in Berlin and it worked much better. I mean, being in the lab and you're all, 
like surrounded by paleontologists you can ask questions you have mm -hmm. you're really more in the in the juice you know so um yeah that worked and i got very lucky actually the the grant passed and i got funding and then i, I could i could do my phd so it took it took a year and a half before i said because i arrived in november of 2015 mm -hmm. and my phd officially started in may of 2017 all right yeah. okay so you like pretty advanced in your I am at the end of it I need at to finish the it. end I'm <laughs> even I'm even more excited now that you're here because I know a few scientists who just recently finished their PhD in this pandemic and I'm just I just think they're just superheroes so thank you again <laughs> for taking time to be here because I know you're probably extremely busy and I think we all know that that I mean dinosaurs are great but you can tell us now that okay. there are way better maybe not better but equally good <laughs> fossils to study and yeah maybe you can share your screen with us and show okay. us what yeah. you want to talk about today oh, yeah. and a reminder you guys can just write your questions in the chat i'll have an eye on that um and here we go very excited let's go is it working do you see it mm-hmm because uh, I'm going to talk about Mesozoars. And uh, yeah, Mesozoars, I wanted to start with a little game. Um, so there, these are a bunch of things. Only one of them is a Mesozoar. Um, I, I don't know, maybe Francie, you can... You, you've seen the slides before, but maybe you can tell me. <laughs> well, uh, I, was, I must say I was most uh, confused about the soup. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the miso soup. It's Which I enjoy very soup. much. So I was <laughs> happy to see it because I don't know if everybody knows what miso soup is, but there it is. If you've never seen it before, it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a dinosaur there, right? There's a dinosaur. There's and... a dinosaur. And then, I mean, obviously there's a mesosaur. I think I know which one that is. Yeah. Um, and then the other one. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and then mosasaur. I didn't get to that one, but they sound almost... The, the same. same it can be confusing right to people it who is very confusing so i think I it happened it. a couple times to me that i was uh telling people that i was working on mesosaurs and people don't know mesosaurs like most people don't know mesosaurs but they've heard of mosasaurs because it's been featured i think in one of the jurassic world films yeah and yeah it's, it's a very very dominant like prominent scene that's very yeah. memorable <laughs> and uh i mean mosasaurs are cool don't get me wrong, but uh, mesosaurs, they're, they're this little, um, um, yeah, they're, they're like the, the hipper kind of thing. Like, you know, it's... it's the hipster you know, of... <laughs> they're the outsider, the, uh, the, the ones you don't really hear about, but they have a lot to tell you. The underdog. Uh, the, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, so mosasaurs are much bigger. They're, they appeared much later in the history of life and mesosaurs, I'm gonna just uh, tell you all about them today. Uh, dinosaurs are a completely different group. They have nothing to do with mesosaurs. Uh, they appeared also much later. And the mesosupi was like, clearly just for the joke. Yeah. Excellent joke though. Yeah. <laughs> so here, what is a mesosaur? So mesosaurs, they're uh, a group of tiny reptiles from the early Permian. Um, so for those of you who don't know what the early Permian is, uh, that is the age that was just before the most important mass extinction in the history of life. So it's before the dinosaurs appeared. Dinosaurs, they started rising uh, about 200 million years ago, I would say. And the Permian is the age that's before that. Um, and Mesosaurs appeared at the age of 280 million years ago. That's a, a long time ago. Um, and there are reptiles. So if you know a little bit about the history of life, you know that um, uh, all uh, terrestrial vertebrates that live today, so that's mammals, birds, uh, reptiles, I know turtles, um, they belong to a group that you call amniotes. It's not really important, but there's two main branches in that tree of life of amniotes. And one of them is the, the, the mammals and the other one is reptiles and birds. And mesosaurs, they are on that second branch with the reptiles and the birds. 
Um, and they are part of a group that's called para-reptiles that I'm going to talk a bit more about para-reptiles later, but um, para-reptiles, they're a group of not really reptiles that were living in the Permian and they had, it was, I mean, if you, if you don't know what a para-reptile is and you look at them, you would probably think that they're regular lizards or like dinosaurs, but they're not. They're older and they're a bit different. Um, and mesosaurs are uh, aquatic reptiles uh, in the group of para-reptiles. And you find them in um, like Brazil, Uruguay, Namibia and South Africa. I think that's also my next slide. Yes. So that's where to find mesosaurs. So you see here on the left, I don't know if you see my pointer. Um, let me see. That should be, Ooh, yeah. that should be here, right? <laughs> um, so here and here are where you find mesosaurs today. If you look on the right, you have a map of what this area looked like 218 million years ago. So you see South America is here. Uh, here you got the, uh, the southern part of Africa and here you got just a tiny bit of Antarctica. And so at the time, the two continents were fused because the Atlantic Ocean had, had not opened yet. And uh, instead there was like a, a sea here, like the, it's called the Rati Sea for the, uh, the part that is now in South, Africa, in South America. And the other part that's in South Africa is the White Hill Sea. Um, but it's essentially a unified body of water. Uh, you can compare it to what the uh, Black Sea is today, sort of. So it's pretty shallow, not a whole lot of oxygen, not a whole lot of water flowing in and out, but uh, yeah, so that's where the mesosaurs were. Um, and so uh, when, you, when you go to Brazil, as I had the chance to do a couple of years ago, um, that's the formation when you find the mesosaurs, uh, you can notice that there is uh, a very big difference in color between yeah. the top part here and the, <laughs> the dark part uh, underneath. So that top part here is um, uh, limestone. I, you don't find mesosaurs in this limestone. You find them in the bed that is below. And that's called the Irati Formation in, uh, in Brazil from the name of the sea or the other way around rather. Because yeah, uh, and uh, this is what you call a black shale, and the black shale is this very uh, thin rock that is very black and uh, made of uh, like a, a superposition of uh, several layers of rock, and so you find some mesosaurs in there. Um, yeah, that's my favorite slide. I love favorite this slide. slide. Um, <laughs> So the mesosaurs, it's actually a family that you call the mesosauri day. Um, and it's not a big family. There's just three species in it um, currently recognized. So there's Brazilosaurus sampaoloensis, the Stereosternum tumidum, and mesosaurus tenuidens. Um, if you just remember the genus names, it's fine. It's going to be Brazilosaurus stereosternum and mesosaurus. And I was uh, talking about black shells earlier. Um, and you can see that uh, Mesosaurus, for example, it is in a typical black shale. So the, the rock is dark and the bones are not preserved. It's like a, a counter, what you call a counterpass. So the bones are gone, but the imprint of the bone on the rock remains. And in the case of Mesosaurus, uh, the rock is so fine, the grain of the rock is so fine that you see a great detail. Um, you, you see these imprints in great detail. And yeah, so I gave, I gave uh, little nicknames to the, to the mesosaurs and there's a reason for that. So the emo elder, the mesosaurs, because it is mostly found in those black shells and, uh, and you don't often see the bones, you often have only those imprints for mesosaurus, which is uh, usually the, the largest of the three. Uh, there you have Brazilosaurus, which is the shy kid because it's not, not so common as the, the, the two others. Um, I've, I've traveled 
in a bit to look at collections uh, in South Af uh, in South America, in North America, and in Europe. And I've seen only a couple of Brazil Zoris, whereas I've seen dozens, if not hundreds, of the, the two others. Um, and then in the middle, you have Stereosternum, which is my favorite. It's the sexy boy because it makes the nicest fossils you have. Uh, so this one is usually preserved in limestone. You see the difference in the color mm -hmm. uh, of the rock. Um, and the bone are preserved brown, like dark brown on this yellow light rock. It makes for beautiful fossils. And sometimes you have like very complete fossils, like this one, for instance, where you see you have the, the head here, you have the neck, the two, the two forelimbs, the two arms, the body here, the trunk, hind limbs, and the tail. And it's almost complete, which for which is very very cool for paleontologists i mean we dream oh, of yeah. fossils like that that is true it's not suddenly always like Jurassic park where they just find a completely assembled fossil just lying around and they just have to brush it a little bit yeah that's <laughs> very find, good reason. yeah <laughs> if you find something like that we're like oh mg <laughs> this is so cool and you i i know now why you nicknamed than that because you can just it's the easiest to see it's like beautiful right mm -hmm. it's I mean, they're all, they're all really beautiful, but that one deck really stands out to me. Yeah, and also, I mean, in terms of what you can do as a paleontologist, um, they're also more interesting, I would say, because the, the problem with Mesosaurus, so the one on the right, is because you don't have the bone, you cannot look at, for instance, the structure of the bone, or you cannot uh, look at the, the morphology, the, for, the, the shape of the bone in 3D, because you only have one half of it. Um, there's a bunch of information that's missing. I mean, you can learn a great deal by looking at, at those fossils in black shales. Um, there's actually, I'm, I'm, I think some of the fossils in black shales are preserved in more details than the ones in the limestone, in the yellow rock, because it's simply so fine. So you see an imprint of every single bone uh, but yeah, it's still a lot of information that's missing. It's it's always a trade-off, you know. It's um, and uh, yeah, but there's there's really cool stuff to do with the Styria sternum, which is a, the the one thing that's a bit of a shame is that um, well they don't bear the same names. So Styria sternum, it's not really obvious that it is a mesosaur when you just read the name, whereas Mesosaurus is, is much more obvious. And Brazilosaurus mm -hmm. is probably stuff to do with it, but. I, I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm like <laughs> just starting to find interesting things about Brazil. So, um, yeah. Well, he's shy, so. He's shy, he's shy. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, there, there's more to find for sure, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, I didn't see a whole lot of him. So yeah, I, I wanted to talk a bit about why is it that we care about Mesozoans because I mean, the, the history of life is full of crazy animals that all have interesting stuff to, to tell us. Um, but Mesozoans are a bit special and I, I, I want to start with their very early fame. Uh, I think that's the first time that most people heard about Mesozoans. Um, is that they have something to do with the theory of continental drift. So, uh, if you remember the map I showed you a couple slides back with South America and Africa connected together, and here you have that sea uh, where the Mesozoans were living. Well, the fact that you find them on both sides of, uh, of the Atlantic Ocean was one of the reasons, um, one of the, the evidence that Alfred Wegner, the uh, German meteorologist who proposed the theory of continental drift, um, used to uh, support this theory. So here the blue thing is the distribution of mesosaurs. I don't remember exactly what the other three are. I think one of them is Lystrosaurus. That's like an ancestor to mammals, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. And the green one is a plant that is called Glossopteris. So you have a plant, a mammal ancestor, mesosaurs, and I have no idea what that one is. I don't remember. But uh, it's, uh, it's like the triumvirate of, uh, of proving continental drift. So people, like when you study paleontology or when you study geology, you hear of those fossils early on because they were used by Alfred Wegener. But that's, that's just one aspect. And it's very interesting for paleontologists. It's interesting for geologists. 
And I'm not a geologist, I'm a paleontologist. <laughs> So the more interesting thing is uh, what they did in the history of life. Um, so I guess most people are familiar with the um, history of um, vertebrates, so animals with bones colonizing land. So you know that from um, that life appeared in the sea. Um, but um, you probably heard that we're uh, deriving from fish, uh, roughly speaking. And the group that derived from fish were the tetrapods. So that means four-limbed animals. Um, and this is a group of, you could call them amphibians. Um, so like uh, frogs, for instance, are tetrapods. Uh, we are tetrapods. And those tetrapods, they went from water onto land. And then uh, a group of tetrapods, they adapted to leave exclusively on land, not have to go back to water to lay their eggs like frogs do. Um, because they invented something that was really interesting. That was the, the egg, the mm. hard shelled egg. Um, and so these, uh, these, these animals, they're called amniotes. So that's like those little guys there. And from amniotes, you have, again, the branch that goes to mammals and the branch that goes to reptiles and birds. And what uh, Mesozoars did, Mesozoars belong to that group on the right, but what they did is they went back into the water. They, uh, yeah, they had this this weird idea of going back into the water, and you got to you got to realize that uh, it took millions of years for vertebrates to go out of water and like become completely independent. And mesozoars, it's a couple million years after that, which in in terms of geology is very soon. They just decided to to say, bah, nah, let's go back, it sucks out there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so if you, if you think about it, there's more animals that did it, that went into, into water. So mesosaurs are one of them, but you have also plesiosaurs. So your typical Loch Ness monster kind of animal. Um, <laughs> you got the mosasaur that we talked about earlier, but you got also mammals like uh, whales and uh, otters that are living, uh, pretty much exclusively in water, like marine, marine otters, might be closer morphologically, roughly speaking, to what a mesozoar is. I mean, um, in terms of how adapted they are to living in water all the time. Uh, yeah, but mesozoars, they're the first to do it. That's yeah. why they're the hipsters of evolution. And they're the hipsters because <laughs> they wanted to try it before it was cool. They did it first. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so there's other reasons why mesosaurs are interesting. Um, might be a bit more paleontologically uh, <laughs> relevant. Uh, maybe more also, um, it's, it's more of a, a scientific controversy that most people probably never heard of. But uh, when you look at the, um, how the, this group of amniotes, the tree of life, of terrestrial vertebrates evolved and the relationship between all those groups. There's one character that has been used, one, one uh, feature on the, the body of these animals that's been used to sort of sort out uh, when, which group was attached where and how they, they grew and developed. And that character is what we call the temporal fenestration. The temporal fenestration is basically a hole in your skull. So if you think about like your skull as a human, you've, you've got the nostrils, that's, a, that's one hole. You got the orbits for the eyes, that's another hole. And you got that arch here where the muscles of the jaw are inserted, that's another hole. And that's a temporal fenestration. And so there's a bunch of animals that try to evolve that thing to have one more hole that is used for uh, muscles to go through and masticate or like just have more um, jaw, jaw power, so to speak. And uh, if you study the, the bones that are arranged around that hole, and like you can see maybe on the picture here, you got like this, all those different colors. So every color is one bone, it's the same bone on every animal. And you can see that there's a whole lot of different arrangements. And looking at, this, at these arrangements is really interesting when you're trying to understand how those very early animals evolved. And 
the problem with mesosaurs is that we're not sure if they have a hole or not. Um, there's some studies that show, like you can see here on the side, that there's a little bit here that doesn't look just like the same around it. It's been interpreted by some authors as being a hole in the skull. Some other authors don't believe there's a hole in the skull. And it sounds very trivial, like why would you care if there's a hole in the skull of your, of your, your, your fossil? It's actually has a lot, it actually has a lot of implications for understanding evolution of those very early groups. And I mean, it's directly connected to us because it, it can teach us about where we come from in a way. We don't come from mesosaurs. <laughs> we're not that cool that cool not yet <laughs> not yet <laughs> um yeah one thing that uh that is a bit sad about mesosaurs is that their attempt at uh going into the water that was highly i'm gonna go back there that was highly unsuccessful oh yeah uh, i said they appeared 280 million years ago they also disappeared 280 million years ago. So <laughs> essentially uh, a snapshot of evolution. They went into the water and they died and it was gruesome. Um, oh, yeah, it didn't no. work. And uh, I'm sure people will have questions about why it didn't work, but I'm, I'm keeping that for later. But okay, if, okay. if anyone wants to know, like feel free to ask now, maybe I, I, can, I can just stop. So yeah, that's that's the relationship of amniotes. Uh, so here you have in green, you have the lineage of, of mammals. So it leads to mammals over there. And that's the reptiles down under. Okay. So yeah, I was saying that uh, mesosaurs have been highly unsuccessful um, in some, to some extent, um, because actually we have a lot of fossils of mesosaurs, like a ton of it. Um, probably most natural history museums around the world have one or several specimens of mesosaurs. It's not the case for many fossils. I mean, not every museum in the world has a, a T-Rex, for example. Uh, but mesosaurs, there's just a ton of it. And it goes, it takes very different shapes. So you have fossils like this. So if you're really good, you could notice that here, there's some things that look a bit different from the rest of the rock. Uh, those are mesosaur bones. And sometimes you have those cats, those casts, sorry. So this is not, um, there's no bone here. This is, as I explained, the imprint of a mesosaur, but you see, it's not the whole thing. It's like just a section of it. You got like the, beginning of the tail here, here you got the pelvis, here you got the, the lower part of the trunk. And sometimes you find like a bit like this where you have bone and you've got the skull, but you don't have the full thing. And I mean, for you, you are talking about that, but for most paleontologists, that's what you have to work with. You, you don't find complete fossils. It's not that Jurassic Park thing where you just arrive in the desert, you take your brush, you scrap the around a little bit, then you have a complete raptor that's just waiting for you to, to study it. Uh, usually you have to do with fragments and it's more of a puzzle game than anything. So you find maybe a vertebra here, maybe you find a, an arm there, like a bit of the skull, and then you have to reconstruct it as the same animal. Some, sometimes you, you're not sure, sometimes it takes hundreds of years that you, you have a bunch of fossils that are described as different species. And then you find another one that just, oh, well, that's that one, that one, and that one combined. And we had no idea. Um, so it's a, a difficult job uh, puzzling, like yeah, bringing pieces together and making sure that you're dealing with the same animal. But with mesosaurs, sometimes you get things like this. And that's really exciting. I mean, I <laughs> want everybody to look at that fossil and realize how amazing it is because uh, that's essentially a complete specimen. And that never happens in paleontology. Like never in a million year will you get something like that. It's, uh, you got the skull, you got the neck, like all the vertebras, the ribs are connected. All the bones are connected to each other. You got every single bone in the, in the limbs, like up to the, the fingertips. You got, and like what is really rare is you got the complete tail up onto until the end. So here you got a really good idea, really good idea of what the mesosaur was actually like. Um, 
and yeah so never in a million years but yeah, if you try 280 maybe you get something like that <laughs> and because there's a ton of them you don't only get the adults you also get the babies sometimes uh, so getting a complete specimen is insanely rare in paleontology but getting a complete baby never happens <laughs> almost never happens i think you can probably count the the number of fossils for which we have babies that are that well preserved on on your fingers yeah and do you know why this one specifically i mean maybe viewers i don't know if the question was going to come but um do you know why this one specifically was so well um preserved because it is so unusual right it is very unusual the thing is uh it had to do with also the reasons why Mesozoar uh, did not succeed at going back into the water uh, is because the environment was very anoxic. That means there is very low oxygen in the water. Uh, when you have low oxygen, you don't get a whole lot of plankton and like little microalgae or things that uh, constitute the first level of the food chain. And then you don't get a whole lot of animals that eat those things and that eat those other animals so there wasn't a whole lot to eat in the sea, and that's why mesosaurs didn't succeed, probably because like the resources were so scarce. So so scarce. But what's great is that an, an environment with very low oxygen it's also amazing for preserving fossils. So when the body uh, sinks into uh, at the bottom of the sea, there's just not enough oxygen for bacteria to develop that will eat the flesh and destroy the bones. Uh, you also have very low currents, meaning that the, the, the bodies are not displaced. And sometimes, you know, when you have a skeleton that's in the sand at the bottom of your sea and there's a current, it takes the bones apart and then you have an arm there, like a skull somewhere. And for, uh, for mesosaurs, there were regions of the sea where they were living that were not like that. So you had a quiet, low oxygen environment, and that's perfect for preserving fossils. And that is why for mesosaurs, we actually have the full, uh, what we call an ontogenetic series, which is uh, every stage of a mesosaur from the baby to the adult. And you have like, let's call it a teenager and a young kid, you see, uh, and that's really interesting. And that's actually uh, what most of my work is based on is that I study the uh, differences between those different stages in in, uh, in mesosaurs. So I like to say that um, I do with mesosaurs what you would do with embryos is that is studying how the shape changes uh, throughout their uh, their growth, uh, which is not a thing that you usually do in paleontology because we don't have that luxury. But uh, yeah, mesosaurs okay. are one of the few for which we can do that. That's really cool because I know in uh, vertebrate paleontology, people often argue if this is a new species or if this is just a young child, like a young version of a grown specimen we have. Um, that is something that happens, especially also in Tyrannosaur, right? People. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, if you, if you um, know a bit about dinosaurs, there is those, those dinosaurs that have a flat uh, mouth. I think they're like they're called duck-billed dinosaurs because it looks like they have the bill of a duck. And uh, quite famously, there were a bunch of species that were described in the 20th century based on the shape of the crest they had. And it turned out that it wasn't different species. It was like females and males and also uh, like younglings that have a tiny crest because the, the big one hasn't grown yet yeah and uh yeah so it's very difficult for mesosaurs uh luckily we can't make that mistake because we we know that it's uh, the same species and we know um that uh, yeah we have the full vision of the their growth we have a question um in the chat mm -hmm. and it's if mesosaur had been more successful going back into the water mm -hmm. do you think they had lived until the dinosaurs died out or even survived if they had been successful if they had like you know gone back and you know it had worked out for them <laughs> um do you think it's yes. they would have survived <laughs> i'm gonna say no um oh no I, yeah it's sad <laughs> i know uh okay so if you look if you look at other groups that successfully adapted to living in water 
So for example, the Loch Ness monster kind of thing, the plesiosaurs, um, they live for like hundreds of millions of years, like close to a hundred million years they lived. That, that's a very long time for a group of animals to, uh, so it wasn't always the same species, but you know, it's like they, they lasted pretty long. Um, and if mesosaurs had succeeded, you could expect that maybe they would have lived that long. The problem is, as I said earlier, uh, there was something that happened at the end of the Permian era, which was the biggest mass extinction in the history of life. And um, it was especially hard on marine animals. So I think 95% of marine animals, of marine species disappeared during that, that crisis. Mm -hmm. And if mesosaurs had been successful and had um, yeah, given rise to a large lineage of uh, marine reptiles, it, it's possible, it's very likely actually that they would have died at this event, however successful they were. It was very hard on everybody and I, I doubt that they, they would have made it. All right, we yeah. actually have a few more questions. Maybe we can quickly uh, address those because they come from sure. YouTube. Um, and someone asked where the mesosaurus forced to return into the water. Like, was mm -hmm. there something that made them go into the water or was it just, you know, they thought it was a good idea? <laughs> Uh, it's it's a very good question, actually, and I don't have the answer. Um, All right. We don't really know, because one thing is for sure is that the, I mean, maybe we don't know yet, but the environment where mesosaurs were uh, living and, uh, I mean, the coast uh, environment of where the mesosaurs were living, there weren't any, um, like, big predators that were that would have like just hunted the mesosaurs and forced them to go back to water. It's also weird because as I said, the, the that, that sea where they went to, there wasn't that much um, to eat there. So they certainly or probably didn't go there for the resources. So it's very vague and very like, yeah, uncertain why they did that. Um, it's always a bit weird to ask why animals do something in paleontology or in evolution in general because they like maybe don't need a reason. Maybe, you know, sometimes it's just the, the hazard that they ended up there. Um, it's a very good question. I'm actually, I would like to find out. I, uh, I just didn't run into data that would have helped me solve that question yet. But it's a very good yeah. question. It's classic paleontology where you're like, I don't know this thing. And I also haven't found any data. About it. Yeah. And you have so many questions, right? It's a lot of detective work. But we need more people working on mesosaurs for sure. Also that, yeah, yeah, that's that's <laughs> true. <laughs> Someone asked, could you tell us more about the extinction event? Because you you said, right, they died out, but um, mm -hmm. was that like a big extinction event that you could get into? Yes, so um, oh, where to start? It's, it's what happened is that um, that's at the time where all the continents um, form what is called the Pangaea. So all the continents we have today, they were one massive continent. They just like merged together and that created one big block of, uh, of continent with very extreme climates. And um, so for example, and the center of that big block, if you think about Australia today, for example, the center of Australia is essentially a big desert, right? So imagine that at the scale of the entire earth, like all the continents. So you can imagine um, that at the center of that big block, there was um, just a big desert, very extreme conditions. It wasn't, wasn't easy on the animals there. And there were also, um, that also created dramatic changing uh, temperature conditions um, that had an impact on the sea life. And you had, um, yeah, I think there was also a, vo a volcanic event at that time. Um, Isn't yeah. it always? <laughs> it's always everything, you know, like the worst that can happen, everything at once. Uh, yeah, and I couldn't tell you exactly, all, like give you a list of all the animals that went extinct at that time, but... Um, a lot, no? <laughs> a lot, I think, especially for invertebrates, it, it was hard, I think, 
if I remember well, there's uh, that, like you know how the shellfish we have today is called bivalves. So it's animals that have two sides mm -hmm. and they open laterally, like mm -hmm. uh, to think of a muscle. It's like that. But before the Permian, uh, life in the oceans was actually dominated by another group of mollusks that looked a lot like the ones we have today, except that they open from top to bottom, so vertically. And um, yeah, those are called brachiopods and they were hit hard uh, by the crisis. So that's why there was a shift. And now we have more bivalves than we have brachiopods. Um, there was a lot of ammonites that disappeared. Uh, they did not disappear entirely, but like a huge chunk of uh, the diversity you had at the time disappeared. Um, just bad news for everybody, really. It's, it's just, just <laughs> terrible. Um, it's, it's really interesting to study that kind of event because, of course, it's important to understand how life uh, reacts and bounces back in, in cases of extreme climatic, uh, yeah, climatic changes uh, or biodiversity crisis. Like, because, yeah, we're just in the middle of one right now, so it's yeah. important to know what <laughs> happened in the past. And yeah, if, exactly. if I could say something maybe positive kind of about that is that when you look at the history of life and like the permanent crisis, for instance, where a whole lot of things disappeared, after that we had a very diverse age with the, uh, the, the secondary age of life, the Mesozoic, where you had the dinosaurs and you had birds appearing and you had all those crazy animals and plants too. I mean, uh, flower plants appeared. So, it was after that big crisis, but uh, yeah, it, it hit life hard, but life bounced back. You know, life it, finds a way. Life finds a way. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't want to say it. <laughs> there we go. I did it for there you. you <laughs> we have we have two more questions. Maybe before we um, yeah. go on, we can quickly talk about them. Um, there's one on YouTube that says, "Doing their short time in the sea, were there a lot of them?" Can we estimate how many there were? Because I know there was just recently a paper that did that with Tyrannosaurus where they tried to estimate how many of them lived <laughs> at their high point. Is there something like that about, no? About Mesosaurus? Yeah. Uh, uh, huh, good question. It's difficult to say, probably a, a lot, lot. Uh, there's not been any study on this, I think, like about the proportion of how many I mean, how frequent mesosaurs were, but um, one thing that is for sure, they're more frequent than any other thing in that sea. So we okay, have okay. more fossils of mesosaurs than any other thing that was living with mesosaurs. And it was actually hard for paleontologists to know what mesosaurs were feeding on because you just didn't find it. Uh, right. Now it's believed that they were eating shrimps mostly, um, but uh, yeah, right. so maybe mesosaurs were, outnumbering everything else that would be weird like it's <laughs> just mesosaurus the questions are giving us good like research options <laughs> for <laughs> questions <laughs> yeah. um and there's one question that said how did mesosaurus reproduce did they lay eggs on land ah it's a very good question mm. uh, um mesosaurs are believed to be uh Viviparous, am I saying that right? Yes. So they are believed to do what, uh, for instance, uh, dolphins are doing today, that is laying fully formed uh, babies uh, directly in the sea. They were not laying eggs, probably. Okay. I will talk a bit more about that uh, later. Oh, yeah, perfect. Maybe we can just go on and yeah. I'll have a, have a uh, look every now and then, the questions. <laughs> Good questions so far. Yeah. I'm very impressed. Um, yeah, I'm going to go on then. And mm -hmm. uh, I think. Thank you like actually start talking about my research and what I did uh, for my PhD. Okay, cool. I'm excited. Yeah. So the first thing is uh, studying ontogeny. Um, so ontogeny is uh, development of, of mesosaur, uh, like for mesosaurs, it's how the, um, the, the body changes from an embryo to the adult, all the changes that occur. When you look at fossils, there's a whole lot of things that you cannot look, you, can, you cannot study. You cannot uh, see what organs were there, for example, because you don't have any trace of those organs. So you have to look only at the bones. But with mesosaurs, because we have those full series from babies to adults, we can do that and we can study the, the changes in proportion. 
uh, and that can um, teach us a thing or two about um, the changes that happen in their lifestyle during their growth, like did the babies eat something else than the adults, were they faster or slower than the adults or whatever, like things like that. You can learn about the really the lifestyle of those animals by studying how they change from a baby to an adult. So this is, for example, uh, well, that's that's a dry figure. It's just like a dot with a, it's a graph. It's <laughs> dots with lines. Um, but here, like what you see, for example, is here you have the size, and here you have those those things that I measured on the skull. So here you have, in green is the length of the skull. In uh, in orange is the length of the snout, and in blue is the length of that region that's behind the orbits. Um, and like for example, uh, one of the things that it teaches us is that the snout, so the, that anterior part of the of the skull, it grows faster than the part behind. So between an, a baby and an adult mesosaur the nose will grow very fast as compared to the rest. And that is an indication that there might be some changes in what they were eating because you need a longer snout um, if you try to catch maybe fish, for example, that the babies weren't doing. Um, and also, it also teaches us that mesosaurs were probably very dumb because their brain case is not growing that fast. So they probably kept a brain that was about the same size between the baby and the adult, or maybe a bit bigger, but like not much. And uh, yeah, so that's the kind of thing you can you can uh, learn. Yeah, and I, um, I I I'm working right now on a on a study like this where I looked at the changes in proportions in a, in a whole lot of different um, bones in the in the body of mesosaurs. So I already talked about the changes in the skull, but uh, there's also interesting changes in the limbs. And uh, as compared to the size, limbs in mesosaurs, especially the hind limbs, they grow in length very fast. And that is because mesosaurs were mostly using their limbs for swimming. I'm gonna talk a bit more about um, uh, this, uh, this swimming behavior of mesosaurs a bit later. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that, that, that's something that I learned looking at the proportions in the boat. Uh, and uh, yeah, one of the good things uh, when you're working with mesosaurs is that there is just so many uh, specimens, so many of them, that you can actually have graphs like this. I mean, if you're, you, if you're a paleontologist, you, you're not used to getting graphs like this. There's a bunch of there's a lot of dots on these graphs and each dot is one specimen. And it's quite often that in paleontology, you have like maybe three or five dots because that's all the specimens you have. But with mesosaurs, there's just so many of them that you can actually do proper statistics, which is exciting for a scientist. That's what you wanna do, you wanna do statistics um, because it, it just makes your results much more uh, robust and uh, meaningful. Um, yeah, so another thing that I got to study uh, in mesosaurs was the ossification. And ossification is the process of making bone, of how bone is growing itself in the body. So during the development, uh, an embryo doesn't have any bones, right? So it starts as a bunch of cells. So here is a graph of what happens in a vertebra, for example. The first thing that happens is that you have a lump of cells that like so sort of clung together and make um, yeah, a lump that uh, will serve as a, a matrix for a later development. And that is made of mesenchymal cells, mesenchymal, never remember how you say that. And then in those cells, um, you start having cartilage forming. So cartilage is not bone, but it's the thing you have in your nose, for example. So it's already a material that is a bit harder than just cells, right? It's not flesh, it's cartilage. Um, but it's not bone, it doesn't have any minerals in it. Um, and then when the, the entire group of cells is turned into cartilage, you already have your bone made of cartilage, sort of, it's, it's like, a it's like a, uh, how do you call that? 
um, the pre the, a patron for for the for the, the the future bone, and then in this thing in cartilage, the bone starts to form. You you call that process ossification. So you have a couple of points in the cartilage where bone cells start to accumulate minerals and build minerals, and it becomes bone. And then at the end, you have your bone. So here it's a vertebra, for example. And um, so in fossils, what usually happens is that you, if you have no bone and you have no minerals, it simply does not turn into a fossil because what remains of a fossil is the heart tissues that, so the bone uh, that is already made of minerals, it's just gonna be replaced by other mineral, minerals and you, you sort of keep a, a copy of the original. But if it's made of cartilage, you don't get that at all. And um, with mesosaurs, uh, we have some specimens where we see the transition between the cartilage and the bone, which is very rare in paleontology. And you see on those pictures that the bones, so everything that is in brown here, they don't have the same coloration everywhere. Mm -hmm. And actually the darker it is, the more ossified it is, meaning the more bone there is. And that's a very interesting thing to study. You can, you can look at uh, the order in which uh, those fingers, for example, are ossifying, like which one is the darker and which one is the lighter. And does that sequence of bone tell us a lot about, uh, about mesosaurs and how they were growing and how they were living? And uh, one interesting thing, uh, yeah, one interesting thing, for example, is that uh, it seems that they um, were growing in a way that was probably different from what other amniotes were doing. I don't know why yet. Uh, I'm still, it's just the beginning of that project for me, but uh, yeah, I'll just looking at this. I'll just look in a bit deeper into this. But yeah, so it's really cool to just see the, the changes. So yeah, you, you have to realize that every, you, you see a bone growing, you have the picture uh, of a bone growing uh, preserved in stone. That's really amazing. That is really cool. Um, we have a question. Yes. Uh, I know it's, um, you're talking more about um, digits and stuff we actually have preserved, mm -hmm. but I know that earlier you mentioned how they were not very brainy, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't have a large brain. I think someone picked up on that and said, how did Mesosaurus brain probably work? Are there any comparable current species? Uh, it's Oof. a good question, but um, it's, it's hard to answer because what we would need for that is what you call um, an endocast, which is you would need a specimen of Mesosaurus that is preserved well enough that you can scan in 3D the 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 chamber in which the brain uh, used to be like the brain case like the brain like right. the brain case is the, the 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 bones around it and what we call the endocast is the shape of that right. hole in the bank the brain case and we don't have that for mesosaurs so they're really well preserved but none of them has that area of the skull that is well enough preserved that we can look at this and it's been done in other other animals, like in dinosaurs, you can do that. And you can look at the shape of the that that hole where the brain used to be. And you can say, oh yeah, well, that, that part of the brain was really bigger than that other parts. So maybe they had like really great vision or they had really great um, uh, smell sense or uh, you can't do that with me. So oh, I'm we don't ashamed. know, <laughs> we know yeah, it was small, but we don't know how it's I remember going fun. going to a conference where they um, did exactly that with like a sticker source. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, we actually found out, because they always said, oh, they have uh, a brain the size of a walnut. And then they were like, actually, I had to say <laughs> the size was actually more like two walnuts. <laughs> and we're like, oh, still pretty stupid. <laughs> still very dumb. Um, yeah. <laughs> to be, to be fair, right, so, okay. most reptiles are not known for their great brains like only birds in that branch of life have developed those huge brains and they can compete with humans uh, with mammals i would say but reptiles are usually pretty dumb and mesosaurs there were early reptiles and they had not yet figured out that they needed big brains to succeed in life 
maybe if it, if they had big brains, they would not have gone into that water, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, someone, I don't know when exactly this question, what part about um, when, what we're talking about, but someone asked, what is the main difference? No anterior, posterior, uh, promixal, distal ossification sequence, question mark. Oh, wow. That's a very <laughs> precise question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the difference between anterior, posterior and proaxial, postaxial ossification. Um, postaxial preaxial, it has to do with the order in which the fingers uh, ossify, uh, in which the, the bone in the fingers form. Uh, so, wait, preaxial, I'm always confusing the two, but I think preaxial means it starts from the inside. So if you look at your hands like that, more like this for you, but that, like that, yeah, yeah, like that. <laughs> Uh, your thumb is in the center and your pinky is on the outside, right? So it means pre-actual that it starts from the center and it goes All right. okay, okay. to the outside. Post-actual is the other way around. Um, most amniotes have post-actual, so it goes from the outside onto the center, onto the middle. Um, and mesosaurs, they might have something else. Nice. Uh, salamanders, they do it from the, the middle to the outside. Anterior, posterior ossification. Um, yeah. So that, that depends. I mean, it depends on what you're looking at, but uh, it might be, I, I, I might have something to say about that later. Uh, but right now, I think it's going to be hard to to explain this without talking a bit more about other things before. So maybe I can <laughs> second half of the question for later. I think you also know this person. They said um, they're called FICO, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're like, by the way, hi, Antoine, greetings, FICO. <laughs> and Michael. he said, really cool, great. Uh, thanks for that insight. <laughs> Um, so yeah, maybe they have uh, read something you've done before. <laughs> <laughs> and someone else asked, how does ossification affect stability and movement? How does ossification affect stability and movement? Um, well, I mean, if you, if you take your nose, for instance, you can move it a, a little bit, right? <laughs> your nose is cartilage. If you try moving your the middle of your arm, it's not going to work as well. So uh, bone mineral mineralized bone is just a much harder um, substrate for muscles to attach and for uh, tendons and things like that. So it's, it's working as um, a hard surface on which you can put more much more forces. So you need ossified bone to to apply big forces it just makes you stronger mechanically all right don't know if that's clear yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right uh yeah so i'm, I'm gonna go on mm -hmm. yes oh, but, well that's just there actually <laughs> anterior posterior ossification there, there's something for you um so I was talking about the difference in coloration in, uh, in the bones. And one thing that I noticed on some mesosaurs was there, you could see that difference in coloration on the same individual from the, uh, the be between the neck on the left, on the right, sorry, and the uh, more posterior part of the body. So here it is the, around the pelvis and those um, that means that the vertebra here in the back of the body, there were less ossified, so the bone wasn't as formed as it was in the neck. Uh, so that would be anterior versus posterior ossification. Uh, ossification. It means the ossification goes faster in the interior part of the body, so the, around the head and the neck, than um, it does in the, in the posterior half of the body. So it goes in this direction. It ossifies first here and then it spreads. It ossifies more and more and more and more along the body. 
So we have that in, um, in the vertebrae. We have, uh, yeah, I had also, um, I noticed also that uh, one of the specimens I had shows a weird pattern for the, uh, the neural arches. So neural arches, if you think about what a vertebra looks like, you got uh, what you call a centrum is the body of the vertebra. It's like a big, strong uh, disc of bone. And on top of it, you got an arch. So it looks like that. I don't know if you see it well. That's the neural arch. And the neural arch is made of two parts. Here, you're looking at the, the baby mesosaurs from the top. So you don't really see the centrum because it's on the, on the belly, but you do see the neural arches. And for example, those things here, those are the two parts of the neural arch. So one on each side. In the middle, you have the, um, how do you call that in English? The spine. Yeah. Uh, your nervous system essentially is sort of uh, uh, contained by the neural arch. And on each of those, so the neural arch is made of two parts. And uh, when you're an adult, you don't see those two parts anymore. It's fused in the middle. And on that baby, what you see is that the arches in the neck, they are fused, but the arches a bit posterior in the body, they are not. It means there is weird, there is this weird pattern that it's closing like a zipper, you know, from the head yeah. to the tail. Pretty and cool. uh, yeah, that's something that had not been studied before in mesosaurs. And it's actually not been studied a lot in, in most, most vertebrates. And uh, yeah, so with that information, I could look at four patterns of actual ossification. So well, that's actually a much better figure to explain what a, a centrum and neural arch are. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here would be what you have in the adult. So you have the centrum here, that's that part here at the bottom and the, the arch above. Uh, but in, uh, in, a, in a juvenile and a baby, it's not fused together. So uh, you can study the order in which uh, those, those different parts, first of all, ossify in the order in which they fuse with each other in the case of neural arches, as you see here, there's two parts, or with uh, between the neural arch and the centrum. So uh, here the blue is cartilage, the yellow is bone. And I studied those four patterns on mesosaurs because I had those amazing fossils that were showing that to me. And with this, I was actually able to run an analysis in many other different animals and sort of recreate the pattern, uh, how it was in the ancestor of all those terrestrial, all those land vertebrates, uh, all those amniotes. And that's the pattern. So here you have a random amniote. It looks like a lizard, salamander kind of thing, generic thing. And um, yeah, I was able to reconstruct how many points in the, in the vertebral column, uh, I, from how many points in the vertebral column the ossification starts and in which direction it goes. And you can see here, like, I'm gonna have to move the, yeah. Um, so for that pattern, the ossification of the centrum, it goes from two points in the column, the neural arches, it starts from the neck, the fusion of neural arches, that's the zipper thing. It also starts from the neck and goes to the tip of the tail. But the fusion of the neural arch with the centrum, unlike the three others, it does not start from the neck. It starts from the tail and goes backwards, which is kind of weird. And uh, yeah, there might be interesting things happening with this. It's really surprising actually that, um, I was able at all to reconstruct a thing over the entire history of amniotes because that's like 300 million years, guys. It's, it's a lot of time for things to change. And if you try to, to change something for that long a time, you might just not be able to reimagine. Like imagine having a painting and every now and again, someone adds a, a dot of color or something. And you do that for 300 million years and you have to reconstruct what the original painting was. So good luck with that. 
it actually worked, but uh, yeah, it's not it's not too often that it happens. Mm. Cool though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna stop talking about uh, ossification for now. I'm going to start talking about uh, another really weird thing that we noticed in Mesozoos with some colleagues, um, and that is caudal autotomy. And what is caudal autotomy? The caudal autotomy is a fancy way of describing what happens when a lizard, for example, drops its tail because there's a predator and it's scared. So it, it sort of leaves the tail behind. It just cuts it. It detaches from the rest of the body. There's a mechanism for that and just tries to escape. In the case of that lizard, he didn't do a very good job because he left his tail like one centimeter away from his body and did not escape at all from the photographer. Um, so this, like if it had been a predator, he would have died for sure. But uh, it's, it's a mechanism that exists in many, many other animals, just not just in lizards. Uh, salamanders do it. Um, yeah, there's a whole, whole lot of animals that do it, even in the past. Um, and some colleagues of mine, so this is a study from LeBlanc, uh, Aaron LeBlanc, in, uh, uh, who's a Canadian paleontologist, and uh, on his team of colleagues were also, was also Mark McDougall, who is also a Canadian paleontologist, but works in Berlin. He is a colleague of mine. And they, they studied the... Caudal, uh, caudal autotomy in a group called captorhinids. And captorhinids are uh, small little reptiles that appeared very, very, very early on in the history of reptiles. And uh, they had some weird features on the tail. Um, so you see here, that's a vertebra of the tail seen in side view. And you see there's a crack in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. And that crack is actually what you call a fracture plan. And that's a feature you need if your vertebra has, has to split in half to drop the tail. Cool. So that's a fossil that shows uh, evidence for uh, that weird behavior that lizards today are still doing. Uh, you see that in the vertebra. And if you look at what we call a histological section, so you cut through the bone and you look under a thin slice, you look at the thin slice of bone under the microscope, you still see the crack. The crack goes deep into the bone. It's not something on the surface. Because sometimes you have things on the surface that look like there's something going on inside the bone, uh, but it's just like ornamentation or something. But here it's a crack that goes deep into the bone and it shows that it's ready to break. Wow. Yeah. So that's captorhinids. And you keep that in mind. And do you see the cracks? in the mesosaurs. I mean, yeah, now that you pointed out, I do see it. <laughs> right. So um, here is the tail of that specimen of sternum. This is Brazilosaurus and this is mesosaurus. Uh, the mesosaur is not bone. Again, it's just the imprint. But as I said, sometimes you have very good imprints. And here it's so good that you can see the crack. You see wow. the crack on the tail vertebrae, uh, on the imprint of those tail vertebrae. Uh, so um, Mark and I and uh, colleagues from Germany and Canada, we looked at these, um, at these cracks and thought like maybe mesosaurs could do caudal autotomy, which would be weird, but maybe they could do it. And we looked, um, we scanned the, the tail and we looked at the, the 3D slices of the tail and we see the cracks going deep into the bone. And we also section a, ta uh, a tail vertebra and looked at, at it under the microscope and we see the, the crack in the tail, um, which mean, which looks very much like uh, it could have broken and that mesosaurs could have dropped their tail. The figure you see at the bottom here is uh, the frequency of fracture planes. So I looked at uh, dozens of specimens of mesosaurs and I, I looked at the tails and I scored on each specimen where the, the fracture plans were starting to appear. And so in blue, uh, you have vertebrae where there's almost never a fracture plan visible. In red, it's almost always there. And in between, it, it means that some specimens had it, some others did not. And you see that it's really steep. It's a really steep curve. Yeah. Uh, you have the first six vertebrae where you have never any fracture plane. And then you have the seventh, uh, this, uh, yeah, the seventh and the eighth, 
where the fracture planes start to appear. And then they always had it for a long part of the tail. Wait, I'm moving you at the bottom of my screen because I, I don't see what I'm doing. <laughs> and yeah, and then the tip of the, the tail, they start disappearing again, but that's mostly because the vertebrae are becoming so small. Mm -hmm. that you really see it, I know. Now, um, if you think about it, mesosaurs, they have this long tail and they're usually represented as swimming with their tails. Now you have an animal that uses its tail for swimming and that could drop it if a predator was attacking, but then how does it swim? Yeah. It, it, it's like cutting your own arm to, I don't know, like you're in a fist fight and you're cutting your arm. It makes <laughs> no sense. And that, that's what we were puzzled about. Like, we're like, could they do it or not? It's very unlikely actually that they could do it. Uh, one of the things that make us say that they could not do it was that if you look at the diff, at the section here, you see that this bone here, it looks a bit like a sponge, right? Mm -hmm. But here you have a big part of it that looks like a, a bunch of layers mm -hmm. on top of each other. And that is much stronger bone that um, it looks like it reinforces that crack and it stops it from breaking sort of, you know? Mm -hmm. So the crack is still there, but maybe it could not split properly. I see, okay. Um, and what we think is that actually mesosaurs probably, they were um, not using that, but it's like a remnant of a thing that was present in the ancestor of mesosaurs and maybe even the ancestor of amniotes and reptiles. Mm -hmm. So maybe the common ancestor to all reptiles could drop their tails and mesosaurs just kept it, but because they had this reinforced thing, they just didn't need it. Right. Um, it's also possible that they could do it, but that they just didn't have any predators that would justify them dropping their tails. Uh, we never found any specimen of mesosaur that has uh, a body and just a tail dropped or a tail that would regrow because like if you look at salamanders, sometimes you have um, uh, when they drop their tails and it grows back, uh, the structure of the new tail looks different from what it was before. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see that in mesosaurs. And one other thing is that mesosaurs actually have these crazy webbing of the fit. So that's all, again, an amazing specimen, two amazing specimens of mesosaurs, where you can see not only the bone, but you can also see an imprint of the skin that has been preserved. So you see it here. We actually oh, yeah. know what the legs of a mesosaurus looked like. And you can see that between the fingers, there was skin. So it was webbed like the feet of a duck. Yeah. Um, pretty chunky legs too. <laughs> pretty chunky legs. Uh, we believe that it it shows that perhaps they were not relying on the tail as a propulsion mechanism uh, as heavily yeah. as heavily as we thought they were. Yes. Maybe they were using their legs as well a lot. I was thinking that when I saw how big they were. Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah. and uh, I mean, you see like how chunky they are. It probably means that there were a lot of um, muscles there mm -hmm. and using it for swimming. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. And these are like really cute mesosaurs. And I think that's all I had to say about mesosaurs. So cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, I learned a ton because obviously it's not my my specialty. So I my I... <laughs> <laughs> really, really cool. Um, we have a motorbike outside, <laughs> but now we have um, a question. I, I put it in the chat, it's also from um, YouTube. Uh, okay. Someone asked, I always wonder why do, I think they meant why would you crack a vertebrae rather than dislocate two? Is there an answer to that? When you want to drop your tail? Yeah, instead like of in like, general? I guess in, in, instead of like really just attaching, why wouldn't you dislocated so it would be I don't know hmm. I don't know <laughs> I think it makes sense like I mean if you I remember being in as a child in Mexico and seeing um which I, I didn't know some kind of lizard on a tree and I thought 
wouldn't it be cool to try and hit it the just the tail with the rocks or drop it because I had no idea how, how it would work and I would just kept throwing little rocks at this poor <laughs> lizard it didn't work I'm bad at aiming oh. still so I never <laughs> saw it saw it in in the wild and I would not recommend throwing rocks at an animal but I was like five but somewhere I hadn't I, I had heard that they do that and I had been fascinated with it ever since mm-hmm. and it's really cool but I did see pictures of what it looks like when it grows back and just kind of like stumpy and just a bit silly looking though no? it doesn't like look the same it just um, looks a bit, like not exactly the same I'm trying to to um to find a good answer for why it wouldn't make sense to to, to dislocate. dislocate it rather than drop it mm-hmm. Uh, that's a good question. I think there's animals that do it without breaking the tail. I don't remember which ones. Mm-hmm. But I think some salamanders, instead of breaking a vertebra, they just like it, it, it dislocates and falls. All right. So it's right. two different strategies. I don't really know uh, if there is like an advantage in adopting one versus the mm-hmm. other. It's what you call, you know, it's convergent evolution. So it's two things that appeared probably independently into groups that are quite far apart. Um, so it, in appearance, it's the same process. It has the same function, but it does not uh, work exactly the same way. And it's just possible that the first reptile to ever drop their tails had an advantage or a feature in its tail that, that made it easier to, to cut it rather than dislocate it. Mm-hmm. I don't really know. Um, someone asked, how does the mechanism work to cut the tails? So animals can choose where to cut their tails, question mark. Can they choose? Like, oh, vertebrate 20 seems good. <laughs> yeah, usually or... they have that in a bunch of vertebrae. So they, it's not like one vertebrae that drops all the time. It's like a bunch of them. Um, but I don't really know how it works. This, that's one of the problems when uh, working with fossils. I... I looked a lot at the uh, the bony features, like the, the 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 characteristics of the bones when you're trying to drop their tails. But it's true that I I don't really know how they do it uh, working working with all the muscles. That's that's really my bad. Uh, but mm-hmm. I you can read our paper. And, uh, <laughs> probably references there for you to to find it. I'll, I'll share it. You have to let me know and I'll put it on social media. <laughs> but that's just what science is like, right? Sometimes it's, it's like a lot of, you can't just observe it happening yeah. in these animals because they're no longer there, right? Um, but yeah, I think... I, th- I think also it's been much more studied in salamanders than it has, in, has been in reptiles. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Because I think salamanders are more of a model organism for, for biology than lizards. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. It could be that the answer is out there and I just don't know it. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, there is, there is room to do more research. Um, For sure. So I have a question about, so the, I think the self-amputation of the tail is super cool. Um, mm-hmm. So when you started your PhD program, is that something that you were aware of or was that just something that you learned whilst studying your subject and you were like, oh my God, <laughs> or is that something you knew that would happen? So aside from uh, measuring the, um, the changes in proportions of uh, mesosaurus bones, none of the things I've worked on were actually part of my project. Mm. It's all side things that we noticed as, we look, as I looked into specimens and as my, my supervisor and my colleagues looked at specimens and we just discussed. It was, oh yeah, didn't you notice that weird thing on that specimen? And then you investigate and it becomes a much bigger thing because what you thought were just a tiny anomaly actually has a lot of implications. Um, but yeah, so the, the tail thing, it just happened because we, uh, I happened to have Mark McDougall in my lab and he mm-hmm. had worked on caudal autotomy. It was like, hey, that looks a bit like fracture plans. And then we, we worked on this, yeah. Very cool. Lots of people on YouTube are thanking you for the presentation and for answering the questions. So, well, well thanks to you for uh, for attending the <laughs> the Tycon Cafe. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, I have a, f- a few more questions, um, and of course, people can still um, ask in the chat. 
And um, I have maybe a very basic question, but I love these questions when I get it. And do you have a favorite fossil? Do you have a fossil mm. that's maybe not your study subject where you're like, this is my favorite? I love it. Yeah, it's a hard one. Mm -hmm. um, so many cool fossils. I, um, I really love the, uh, the Berlin Archaeopteryx, a really cool one, of course. It's very iconic. It's the best one, too, in it's my opinion. It's the best one, too. Yeah. It's much it better than all the other Archaeopteryx that you will ever see. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the one you in London. You can see it, right? Yeah, there's one in London that they're just kind of shoved in a corner because they know it's not <laughs> as good as ours. <laughs> yeah, they, they're not as proud as we are. Yeah, that's or true. Archaeopteryx. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's some fossils that I've uh, worked with that I find. I mean, some of my mesosaurs, I'm not going to lie, I think they're the best fossils I've ever seen. <laughs> um, that one that is uh, that has the skin the skin imprints is really amazing. It's it's always incredible when you find something that is so old and that has the skin preserved because when you know a bit about how like how fossilization works. It's so very unlikely that you're, it's like a grail of, of a paleontologist finding such things. Like you learn so much, this, all those things that you never see about a fossil that suddenly appear, in, um, appear to you. Um, I also really liked, um, so my master's project was about uh, parareptiles and the preservation of parareptiles. So parareptiles for a reminder, that's that group to which mesosaurs belong that belong to reptiles as a whole, like the great lineage of reptiles, but they're not the reptiles that we know today. And they disappeared, most of them disappeared during that big mass extinction actually, at the end of the Permian. And uh, a couple of them survived more million years and then they, they all died and there's no pair of reptile alive today. But um, uh, yeah, there is, there is, this uh, this one pair of reptile that's called Udibamus that is really funny. It's a um, it, it looks like a lizard that has two long hind uh, back legs, and it's uh, it's been proposed as being the first uh, animal to be able to walk on two legs on its back. Oh. Yeah, it's really fun. It does sound cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, then I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's always difficult to choose like one fossil that you really love. Uh, I really love my my baby mesosaur, the tiny one. It's it's so cute. It's it just cute. so cute. Um, yeah. But how big can you can you show how big it is? Like, it's just. It's about. <laughs> do I have something that's mesosaur sized? Is it the size of this? It's. It's, <laughs> it's about that size. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's really, it's really tiny. It's no, it's actually smaller than that. Uh, well, the rock is about that like size. a remote, <laughs> like a remote. Yeah. Wow, that is small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very small. And an adult, an adult mesosaur. Actually, there was one figure with a scale, but an mm -hmm. adult mesosaur is about one meter in length. So it's not very big animals. Mm. But oh, uh, right. I mean, that's quite a growth from uh, like that to yeah. A meter, you know? Okay, okay. <laughs> and um, right now, obviously, everybody is mostly at home. I mean, we are. Usually it's at the museum, right, where, where we work, but it's here. Um, did the current situation change how you work at the museum, or did you have some more field work planned that you couldn't do, or can you just go on as usual, just working from the computer? Because I know I did a lot of research just really at my computer looking at yeah so i was i was lucky enough that um i had collected most of my data for my phd before the pandemic started um so i did a big collection trip in north america i did a big collection trip in brazil mm -hmm. i collected a whole lot of things there but uh so i was okay i had material to work with during the pandemics but of course it's much harder uh, to work when you don't have access to your fossils. So I wasn't able to go to the museums for many, many months and not look at my mesosaurs. Um, it's also more difficult to collaborate with people 
mm-hmm. um, because they also have in their countries different corona restrictions than I am, for example, waiting for um, uh, to publish a, a paper on uh, on that actual ossification patterns and the ancestral thing in amniotes. And I'm and it's it's blocked because the situation in Brazil is so dire right now that it's it's just impossible to get some some information because mm-hmm. there's nobody there. They just cannot go to museums. So it's really hard. Not because it's difficult in Berlin, but because it's it's difficult everywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it has changed uh, a little bit. It um, has changed a bit, yeah. All right. And um uh yeah um do you have well let's let's start with this one what is the worst thing about your job is there something the worst you could, thing yeah it's, what would you what would you get rid of if you could <laughs> <laughs> um the worst thing is when you hmm, when you start looking uh like the rate the the ratio between the amount of work you can put into something and the results it provides might be the worst thing because it can be it can be very um, disappointing. I mean, you asked me if all those projects were part of my initial PhD proposal, and I said no. It's mostly side things, and that's that's I think it's great, but sometimes it's also a bit tiring. It's a bit exhausting that. Um, that little side thing that you just looked at turns out to be an amazing project. But sometimes also you, you spend a lot of time working on something. It just doesn't provide what you expected. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, that's not a big problem. There's like, there's so many things that are interesting in the job of paleontologists that are, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the problem with every, with every scientific work, I guess, mm-hmm. is that you don't know what you're going to, you're going to get. I like I like your answer because it gives insight in what it's like to be a scientist because sometimes you don't get what you expect or what you hope for and um, because usually when I ask this question lots of people say um, applying for grants <laughs> or oh, all the paperwork <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's obviously like the top choice for many but I think um, I like that you you know you, you said that um, every now and then you think oh this is cool let's look into that and you put so much time into it and it's not the outcome that you hoped for. I would yeah. say one thing I like about writing grants, I mean, like is a big word, but it forces you to shape your project and to put some perspective into, you, you cannot, usually, usually you cannot just say, oh, I want to look at that. Mm-hmm. You have to say, I want to look at that to find this. And if this doesn't work, I have to do this. Sometimes it's good to, to put a little structure in your, in your project. It's not always easy. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you structure something and it, it doesn't happen at all. I don't think I know a, a single uh, doctoral researcher who did exactly what they planned to do in their initial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> True. But, um, um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. In contrast, what is your favorite thing about your work? Oh, the everything <laughs> traveling and meeting people mm-hmm. it's, it's, that's that's amazing you you go to to different countries and you work with so many different people that have different perspectives and you learn so much at their contact um and also sometimes you 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 travel for field work field work is amazing it's i mean yeah. i think a lot of paleontologists went into paleontology because of the field work yep um, <laughs> You spend a lot of time in a, a in one one spot, and you dig out rocks, and you break them, and it's it's painful, it's difficult, and it's too sunny, or it's too wet, or it's too, it's always too something. It's not, never the perfect weather, but you find stuff, and you find animals that have been dead for like millions of years, and they can teach you about the history of life, and it's and that's pretty cool. Yeah. And as I was in Brazil, I. That was in 2019, so I was already two years into my PhD. I went, I went to Brazil and I went to one of those sites where the mesosaurs are found. And it was a sort of a pilgrimage for me. It really felt like I was uh, visiting a holy place <laughs> because you, you just I had been working on mesosaurs for two years and my head was full with, with their stories. But then you get there and 
it's where they are. And you like you turn a rock and there's Mesozoars there. And it's, it's such a great feeling to, to just, yeah, do something that you know no, no one else before has done because that rock that mm-hmm. you, you break and that you take out of the, 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 the cliff, it, it has a fossil that nobody has ever seen before you. It's, it's just a great, great feeling to be truly the first to discover something. I think that's one of the appeal of paleontology. Mm. That's also my answer, always. The, yeah. The, yeah, you put that really well. <laughs> um, someone asks, do you need the original fossils for your research or would 3D scans suit? Would that be fine? It right. depends what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, 3D scans are great because you can do, uh, it's very cost efficient. Uh, you don't have to travel around and take measurements. You can just have the scan and do it on your thing. You can manipulate the scan. You can do, um, you can reconstruct how the, the animal was moving, how it was like the, the entire skeleton, how it was articulated. You can, um, you can model forces on the scan and like maybe try and see how uh, the forces that were uh, created by a skull or something like that. Uh, that's great. And you couldn't do that with just a fossil, but on a fossil, you see things that you don't see on the scan. It's very complimentary, mm-hmm. actually. Um, yeah. For what I do, the scans haven't been that helpful yet. Uh, I have some scans, but um, when you're trying to study development, it's more interesting to have the actual fossil. Yeah. Yeah, that makes- so it feels great. Like this, the feeling is not the same when you have a slab of rock with the mesosaur on it and you can look at it and you can show it to everybody. Yeah, that's that's true. Or a 3D like- scan. A 3D scan is a bit, I mean, it's like we're all used now to the difference between digital connection and uh, real life connection, right? So <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a bit of the same. You do different things, I would say. Good point. For my thesis, I had to just stare at like, CT images all day because I looked inside the bone right. and also it was in the exhibition and people like visitors came to look at it so I couldn't just be like I'm taking this and I'm back in like a month <laughs> I had to just work with the with the scans and I know that sometimes people were a bit disappointed that I only look at CT scans like when I tell them about my work they're like yeah, yeah yeah it's really cool but oh you never get to just hang out with a fossil I'm like if I did, then the visitors couldn't see because I worked on Tristan, right? The, um, mm-hmm. the T-Rex and it was in the exhibition all the time. So I was glad that I had, <laughs> had the scans. Um, I mean, but it's, in, it's, it's always, right? It's like you said, it can be complimentary because uh, when I worked before that, I worked with the stuff and I could actually touch it. But I could also then, same thing, look in there to look at the teeth and stuff. So it's really helpful that we have this technology, but having it in your hands and touching it and looking at it, it's obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's a new era of paleontology. What, what all, all the things we can do with 3D scans, I mean, it's much more affordable. There's many institutions now that have a scan mm-hmm. and you can do a lot of things that you were just not able to do before. But paleontology can only work if you have fossils and so you need field work, you need people that go excavate the fossils, prepare them and make them suitable for working with them. It's just, yeah, yeah it's very, yeah. it's just complimentary. <laughs> and then I would like to ask um, all my speakers if you have advice for like a, maybe someone younger is watching or a young researcher or a high school student, what advice would you give them for going into science? Is there something you wish you'd known? Or yeah, just general advice. Um, Okay. So I think it's great to do a research project. If you're like a bachelor or master student, it's definitely something you get into a lab, you learn, you learn how to read papers, you learn how to draft results, you learn all those things. It's really important. I think if you're, if you want to do paleontology, it might be more interesting to work on a process and trying to understand a process rather than trying to work on one animal in particular. Uh, I don't know if that's an advice, like the kind of advice you're looking for. Um, But for example, you're trying to understand um, how bone grows 
in a bunch, you can do that in a bunch of different animals. If you're just looking, if you're trying to understand how that animal does, it might be a bit restricted. And if it doesn't work, then you, you run out of things to do. <laughs> okay, I get it. Yeah. So I would say that. And also, yeah, you 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 got to do field work if you want to do paleontology do field work it's so great it gives it gives a great incentive to when you, you when you take a fossil out of the ground you really want to work on it and like just understand everything about it so yeah do field work yeah and for everybody who is watching this i know i talked about this online a lot this past week that I did field work in america because you don't usually unless you lead the excavation you don't get paid you have, um, or if you like further on in your career, um, usually volunteer. And if you feel like you can't afford it, because I also had to like work several jobs as a student um, to like, just do what I do. Um, there are also um, opportunities in Europe. Um, like I also did field work in Germany and I know there's like Portugal and like that. So there are more yes, local yeah areas too so if you um if you hear oh america and brazil i can't afford that it's pretty pretty sure that uh, from wherever you're watching um there are also opportunities in your country <laughs> and i think over the years there's been a something that's built is the impression that maybe um the united states for example have more fossils than other places because I think the paleontologists in America were very early on good at communicating their, their results and their, their discoveries. Uh, but there's a lot of fossils in Europe. There's a lot of fossils in Germany. There's like, there's fossils next to you. You can, like not far away from where you live, wherever it is, there's probably a site where there's fossils to find. Mm -hmm. uh, it might not be dinosaurs, but you know. Uh, we learned today a lot of stuff is cool too, so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like where so, I'm from, there's no dinosaurs, but you can find a lot of uh, deposits from the uh, the Ice Age, and you have also uh, a lot of ammonites and marine stuff from the the time the dinosaurs were around. So you know, no yeah. dinosaurs, but plenty of cool stuff. Yeah, that's true. And maybe you find invertebrates exciting. So there we go. The thing <laughs> I think invertebrates are not taught properly in mm. paleontology and because everybody has the cool kids in, in mind so the vertebrates are like the cool stuff but in vertebrates <laughs> you can do so much with them and there's really crazy things so don't yeah. overlook yeah don't look down on, on invertebrates exactly exactly yeah if they i think um you answered a lot of questions today there were lots of questions on youtube which i think we we got to and then some here so you're like my question answering expert now so <laughs> well done <laughs> wow. and i think it's always cool to get um questions that like for doing events like this you get asked questions that either put your own research in perspective or make you think about oh i could look into that that's really cool or you know it's um mm -hmm. broadens how you think about your own subject and i think that's that's why I like these these events. <laughs> and thank you so oh, much. I, I might time. I might have sorry I might yeah. have um, one advice for people who want to work in paleontology. Paleontology okay. is becoming more and more a side um, a sub branch of biology rather than geology. It used to be geology, but if you work on vertebrates, for example, it might be more interesting to study biology first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would yeah. Be. Or you can just switch. Like I think some people, like when I started out with geology, um, because my, my advice, for example, is always that if you're passionate about it, you can find a way. Because I was very bad at math, and I, I thought I was um, I couldn't do it. You know, if there's so much like science, the hard sciences, I was very good in English and history and biology. But biology was really the only science I was good at. And then when I started studying geology. I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to make it. It's just too much physics. It's chemistry. Oh my God. But I had the motivation to do the research and that really kept me going. Like my, like my, my wish to do research and I persevered and <laughs> then I switched to biology. In the beginning, I didn't even know I could do that. So mm. um, very often it's, 
it's possible to switch fields for your master's or um, go in a bit of a different direction. And that's what I did. And um, it really helped me because I also now know how fossilization works because I learned it in my undergrad and what kind of rocks can contain fossils and all that. <laughs> uh, but then I got to uh, do more of the biology stuff. Like you said, it became more and more like a biology sub branch. <laughs> and I think if people are unsure, they, um, they can just try out different, different things. I think that's really exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, may I just share, I think I'm going to share one last slide where I'm, I'm yeah. supposed to thank a whole lot of people um, <laughs> that have been working with me over the years. So there's my lab in Berlin. Uh, those are all great people. And some of them are on publications I talked about. Um, like Jürg is my supervisor, Mark mm -hmm. uh, is that postdoc who worked on, on Codol Totem, he's a great guy. Um, and uh, yeah, all the others, they didn't work on Mesozoars with me, but uh, they're, they're very good friends. I have to thank all the collection managers because I did visit a lot of collections and they helped a lot, every yeah. single one of them. And uh, yeah, I got uh, also other collaborators and friends that, uh, that have been very helpful. Yeah. I know a lot I of those names. People. It's you know, exciting to see. Like I know Jasper as well. You know Jasper, yeah. Yeah, and um, because I he was a kind of science speaker last mm -hmm. last year, and um, yeah, he's um, is he from the Netherlands? I think he's from the Netherlands. Yes, Netherlands. Yeah, and of course, I know a few of the people in the Furbish lab. So lots of great people on this slide, <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, right? Like collection manager, they're really so helpful and. Like I mentioned earlier, my very first speaker um, that I had for Cafe Clutch when it was first started out, <laughs> he was actually, his name is Andreas, and he works at the museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's the collection manager for the invertebrate paleontology. Um, yeah, for the fossils there. And we, I think he was a year above me, the same university, and that's how we know each other. Mm -hmm. And um, he's collection manager now. And um it's I uh, learned more about his, what his job is like. I'm like so glad to have people like you. <laughs> it's so helpful. <laughs> yeah, there's that's the thing with like paleontologists. You usually think of the the researchers, but there's the collection managers and the preparators mm -hmm. that know so much. Yeah, everything, and we are just in our corner, like working on our fossils. But they they do a whole lot of work, and they're they're really amazing. So that is shout true. out to them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and lots of people said said thank you in in the chat and thanks again for taking your time and so say thank you so much. Uh, listening to both of you makes me want to become a paleontologist and go on field trips. <laughs> Yay! That's exactly I'm really what glad. I'm. <laughs> really glad I, I, I uh, made people happy and uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Fancy, for for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for joining and especially on like a Sunday. Thank you so much. And that's so great um, to, to learn from you. And yeah, uh, if you're interested in seeing, well, both of us again, we both um, do something called Pint of Science where we do usually pint science in a pub, <laughs> but this year it's on online. And um, I think we're both, we're both going to be there, right? Because we're on the Berlin team. Right. So I'm going to put put it in the pint. Oh. It's going to be on the 17th, 18th, and 19th of May. And there's three talks a day in the evening about very various topics. So if you guys are interested in science in general, it's not paleontology, but there's there's everything. I mean, pa paleontologists are going to be there. So at least that's Yeah, something. there's going to be some paleontologists. <laughs> yeah. Always one of us somewhere. Yes, always there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have another... Kaffee Klatsch mit Wissenschaft. I think it's on the second. I'm pretty sure my team is going to put it in the chat, but we have another one um, in June, right after. God, it's going to be Long Night of Science and the Sunday after. Um, it is the sixth. It's the sixth of um, June. Yeah, there is. There's the link. And it's going to be in German. So we're switching it up again and going to have a German Kaffee Quatsch. And it's a lot about uh, digitalization, um, how to digitalize collections. And I think that's super exciting too. And if you want to do a survey, then I can learn more about what you guys like and what other topics we maybe um, can talk about. So if you're interested in that, um, you can fill that in. Then I'm going to learn what you want to hear. 
And if not, I'm going to just get more and more paleontologists, you know, because <laughs> um, that's what I like. But yeah. Should I, should I fill in the survey? Or do you, are you not interested in what I like? No, I'm interested in what you like. But um, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you tell me how you liked your own presentation today, <laughs> <laughs> you can. Um, but I know I liked it a lot. So thanks again. And I hope to see lots of you again in the future. Um, yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs>